Ja, det er klart. Ja. Morning. Um, this is this presentation was uh, provoked by Visity finally adopting Git, and after uh, I think eight years of Mercurial and how many years? Ten, twelve of Subversion. Uh, I suspect that there were a lot of thinking patterns and habits that may not be valid anymore. So that's why I wanted to talk a bit about the sort of principles and data structures of Git and the mental model you should be working from in Git. Um, so it will, it will be a bit, uh, I, I call it an impractical guide because I, anything like how to get your daily work done is covered in guides online, so I'm not going there. But it's also on another level overly practical in that I go into details that are lower than you usually need to. I will be using the tools I got used to in the early days of Git, which are quite bad. There are better versions of every visualization tool I use. So don't don't take this as advice on tools for viewing history and such. I'll be doing some live examples in the console, and I appreciate uh, relevant interruptions if there's something that's unclear or you want me to expand upon. Just start talking loudly. Uh, so I divide it into three parts, which I mentally think of as different layers of Git. The first, on the very low level, uh, Git operates on what we call a content addressable file system. Uh, can also be said to be a database where the IDs of all the content is the SHA1 hash of the content. Uh, it means that you never ask for anything in Git by like a name or a, a separate reference, like an ID, you ask for it by a hash of its content. It will probably become clear what uh, good things this implies later. And after that part, I'll go into a how this file system is used to make a sensible project history with commits and diffs and branches and all that stuff. And in the very last part, I'll go into how distributed uh, repositories are modeled, because that's on another layer on top of this. N none of these abstractions uh, blend together on the low level. Uh, so in the content addressable file system, uh, there are three types of objects you can store. It's any sort of file, which we call a blob, and a tree, which is typically a folder. It's a thing that contains more trees or blobs. And finally, the commits, which is... Um, I just do it this way and metadata, which means a commit contains the project folder and everything in it. That's in a commit plus metadata, which is who committed this, what was the parent commit, um, and a few other things. I'll show them later. So to give an example of how things look in this database, Let's make a new project. There. And I will, in this project, you see, when I initiated it, it created this .git folder. This .git folder is the repository. <coughs> we will look into it in a bit for the, see it contains some basic config, some empty stuff and uh, 
this we will come this objects is where the file system is stored. Uh, refs is where the branches are stored. We'll go into those later. The other things I'll not touch today. Uh, let's make a file readme. Uh, let's make it actually multilingual. So in the US they say And we will add a British version. There it is. And we will create the German version. This I learned this in Germany from school. And let's add it to the uh, Git repository. Since I'm on Windows, it has my line endings. This can be this can be solved with some configuration, but I'm not bothering now. And when we commit them, they are first put. Each of the files are put in the uh, file system, the Git file system, and a commit on top of them is created and all that stuff. So let's look at that. These objects have been created. Uh, it doesn't really say here what they are, but we can we can look at what the hash would be for the the readme us file had this hash, so that's the object stored here, and we can verify that by. So note that the file name is not stored in this uh, immediately, it's just the content. Um, we can try to pull out, what's this, the, we can also see that the GB readme has the exact same hash as the readme US. Uh, this is important because the files are identical, so they get the same hash, and there's only one object stored for both of them. So it's once you get a bit of compression for free when you add duplicate files, remove files, and add them later, it won't start just putting in a entry for each one. I see it in the same detail. Yes, the, as the the only thing that's stored here is the hash and the content, like uh, folder, file name, ownership, nothing else is here. That's stored in the tree object. Let's see if we can find which one is the tree object, just for fun. Uh, This, yeah, I did. I guess right. This is this is the tree object that's created, and you see it refers to it, it has this is file system ownership. We have a blob for with the name readme.de with this hash, and same readme db us same hash. And if I looked at these two, I would also find the commit, but I'm not going to bother. So to visualize this another way, this is my project folder. I have a subdirectory called lib, which contains some random version of jQuery and two files with an index. This will be stored, if I commit this, it will be stored in Git as one tree for the root of the project, which itself contains a tree, which is the lib folder which again contains the jQuery file and 
this open borders. Uh, and this, I, when I commit my first commit here, it will take, uh, it will store, like I said, the tree for the project folder plus some metadata, which is uh, timestamp, author, and the commit message. There are a few more fields that are just basically like uh, different type of author, different timestamps, but these are the important ones. And a commit can also refer to a parent commit. It doesn't have to because the first commit has no parent. So here is the project history of an imaginary project. This is the commit object, which uh, points to the tree, which again points to each of the files. The, I do some changes and do another commit. It refers to the parent. It has probably, since I bothered to commit something, different stuff in the project. And all of this is referenced and stored explicitly. Uh, as in the it refers to the it refers to files and the files are contained in the in the git uh, repository so given this can anyone guess what this implies Reverse. yes it reverts because the new commit points to a tree that's identical to a file system file uh, project file state that's identical to the one to uh, back, so it the hash will be the same as the hash of this tree, and it points to the same tree object. And that was the end of part one. Questions so far before I move on to how we put, how we work history on top of this? I know you want to say anything about big files, huge files? Uh, I can. Uh, there, there are. This is the model that we work from when we run commands and work with the Git API. But under the hood, Git has a ton of compression. For it can, it can ha make incremental diffs to store some parts of it in a very clever way. But you access it as if everything was stored just as files with no trickery. The abstractions that handle big files don't usually shouldn't bleed out there. Uh, so next part, uh, given this file system, how do we make a project history out of it? And which is a phrase that everyone probably has noticed when working with any version control system is directed is a graph. And important part of it is that it's append only, which means the git history, you don't you don't change stuff in it, you only add stuff to it. And again how what is this head thing that you keep seeing when using Git, and how do we work with branches? So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the we we have an explicit this each commit is an explicit state of the project structure with the files as they are now. If you read out the commit object and read out the tree object and read out all the object it points to, you get the exact state of the system at this commit, you do not get a like a diff from the previous one or anything like that. So on the surface it looks like we are just duplicating everything for each commit. But again, because of the content addressable file system, we don't duplicate unless something changes. And of course it does some clever stuff to optimize even further. Um, and parent, we can have zero parent, we can have one parent, and of course, we can have multiple parents. 
So given this, there's a commit, there's a next commit, and we keep adding more commits to this project. And we can keep adding more commits based on this. This is just a typical branch. The only thing I want to mention here is that we do not change this part in any way. We just add this, which points to that. Um, it's going to be very important for making sure we can basically merge and clean anything. Uh, but given this, it's not very practical to work with, since you are working with a current state of the project. Your files are either in this, you're working on this branch, or in the master, or whatever these are called. So we have an abstraction over this graph, which are called refs. And the most, the, the simplest one is the head ref. That just means wh what is the state of your file system now? Wh what sort of, which commit uh, are you basing it on? And if I do some work and commit, the head is, is follows automatically. And if I check out the previous version, the head will point to the previous version. And if I commit there, I make a branch. So I can show, just to illustrate, in this, uh, I have this head object, as we see here, in the Git repository, which is an indirection. And it points to this object. And this object, again, is, you probably guessed it, but it's the, this will be the commit object of the uh, current commit. Initial commit, and here we see it refers to this tree we saw earlier, author, committer, and commit message. Uh, but this head is not very, it's enough, it's not enough to be useful. So we have different types of refs, which are the same thing. They just point to some commit via the commits hash. Uh, we have here a, the master branch, which is what is created by default. And this is what you usually work on. This is the version one branch. And here we have a, I call it yellow to mark it as a tag. This is to just, this is not something we work from. It's just pointing to this commit and saying this was version one that we released. So we can go back to it and look at it at some point. And if I commit to master, it creates the new commit, moves the master branch. Uh, so you don't, uh, it, yeah, it's a bit, Automatic. It will be too much of a hassle to do this manually. So to um, show the development history, no. Yes. I will have this. Like I said, shitty tools. This is the worst tool in the world for visualizing project history, but. Unfortunately, it's the one I got used to, so that's the one I'm showing. Um, we show. Let's go get K. Um, here we have the entire version graph. It's one commit. Um, Sorry, it has a resizing toolbar that's quite invisible and it just got hidden below the screen here. Uh, yeah, I can see that. That's it. Uh, and let's try to 
have some uh, some changes to this. Actually, the, the get logic usually also is straightforward. So we can do the same thing, but we don't get the like the tree view if you have it a bit complex. So let's check out. Let's start the branch. Uh, git command is checkout dash p take out new branch. The the command the command line commands of git are, are quite bad. I think they are very intuitive. Uh, now we created this new branch. It shows up in in the in the git refs folder. So that's when it did. We have master earlier. Now we also have version one, and we can look at it, and we see it. Since we were at master when we branched it, they point to the same commit. If this shows up properly, and no, it doesn't. Sorry. And and the visual representation shows that these two branches are in the same commit. And if you remove the British version of the README, this will have updated. Uh, this will have. Uh, now, now we see that the version one branch that we're working off has changed its version from one D blah 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 to seven five blah blah blah. I'm sorry for keep bringing up this tool, but it's, now we see we have a divergence from us here. Uh, and so, but this is fairly trivial. I'll do something a bit more interesting. When you create this custom model, does it account for the fact that you just had the head? Uh, yes, correct. Then the head will indirect. Yeah, the head will point to the version one point zero bunch as an indirection. Okay. Check out. The checkout always moves the head. Yes, correct. The checkout command moves the head to either a just a plain commit or okay. it's pointing to a commit via some branch. Um, And let's do something more interesting. This is let this this is me trying to work on a Geoteca DPA two three eight two. So I have created a branch for it, and I diverge from master somewhere up here. And these are my latest commits. And in the last commit, I misspelled the commit message. So I have this. Here, uh, so the at the top, add a more pointer. So I'll fix that. I want to amend my commit. No, not the cat. That's, that's horrible. Okay, this popped up my default editor. I will have a different commit message. And now the log shows the remove stupid button, add a no pointer, which correctly spelled. Uh, but I also have this change that, that I, in my previous commit, I just forgot to save a file. This is, I feel this is impolite to whoever is going to review my changes, so I would wish I could make something that's easy to deal with for them. So I can do this. A bit more complex command. Uh, I say I want to go from head five versions back and reconsider everything here. And this gives me a uh, this one. 
no, it gives me a sort of, this is, again, there are better tools for this, but here we have something as cool as an interactive text file where it shows us our log history. So this is the one that was really supposed to be part of this commit. So I'll say that this, this was just a fix up. That's documented that we discard the commit message and take all the changes of this commit and mash them into the previous one. And it's now gone from the visible log. And again, now it's a bit clearer from the history that I did something and just reverted it again, which again, I just want to clean up. I'll do another rebase and actually let's just let's just remove these two commits entirely. I don't need them. And now the state of the system of the repository looks like this. And this is a lot easier to look at if you want to see what you did. It makes for a cleaner diff when you want to merge back to master and it's easier to review. But if you didn't actually, uh, I mean, the commit message suggested that you added something and you removed pretty much exactly the same. But yep. if you actually did some more stuff there that you didn't think of, didn't put it in the commit message, that would now be in the div to the newest one, right? Because uh, that one wouldn't have changed the yeah, snapshot the, of the, file. the The one that was the fix up. Yeah, that one went to the previous one. Yeah, that melded into the previous one, so the that would be... The drop goes the other way, I guess. The yeah, the, the drop just takes out uh, all changes automatically, so any other stuff I did in those commits uh, will not be here anymore. <laughs> but, but the commit that you have in the end, right? That yeah. would have been the perfect snapshot of what, what you had with the commit. Yeah, the yeah, game, right? So yeah. the newest commit would still have the changes, right? Yeah, sorry. It Otherwise, would, uh, it would be a different commit. Uh, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's recreated. Yeah. Uh, so it will actually not contain any changes that were committed and then dropped later. Okay, so the, the diff of, of these two could now have changed by dropping the commits in the middle. So they didn't actually... Yeah, correct. So it wasn't just the commits going away that way, but also the... Yeah, the changes. Yeah, okay, the changes. Well, yeah, okay. it, it uh, recreates commit based on the diffs, so it's okay. a bit complex. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. Uh, this is all uh, funny trade. Yeah. Yes, I will answer that. It's easier to answer in some upcoming slides. Okay. So, uh, and just to point out something, when I dropped the commits, uh, like I said, the, in, <coughs> um, the initial data model is append only. It doesn't support removing stuff. The only thing I did was create different versions of uh, different versions of these commits, added them to the drop and move these pointers around. So I did not destroy or remove anything. I did this. Uh, this is the original state of the project. And I remove, I created, instead of this commit, I created a commit with a different commit message. And now this was the head. Then I uh, squished this one, resulting in this history, and then I removed, uh, made a new history, removing these, and this is the end result. So all the previous states of the pro of the project is still in there. We can still uh, check out this version if I realize that this last thing where I dropped two commits is wrong or 
I like you said, if I had some changes here that wasn't in the commit message that I'm missing, I can uh, go and check this out again. Um, so show we have a handy uh, emergency sort of tool. Git logs refs. The ref logs are amazing if you need to clean up disasters. Uh, let's see, this is not the prettiest way to do it. Let's try to make it a little bit better. Uh, this is showing any, all the operations and changes that happen to the DP3382 branch. So I went from no commit to the first commit with the commander showed on the right there, created a bunch, and here are all my, this is the amend commit, I think. Yes. Yeah, this is the amend commit. This is where I started messing around with it in this example. So this was the, this had here before I started messing around. So I can always just check out this if I want to. Let's actually do that just to be uh, to be clear. Uh, yeah, now Git gives me a lot of warnings because unless you are really doing some emergency stuff, you do not want to work with what they call a, a detached head, where you are pointing just to a commit with where there's no branch or uh, anything. And here we have some files that doesn't exist anymore in the newest version. And here we see the history as it was before I started messing around with the misspelling and the stupid commits and everything. We go back to the current state and go on. So one thing I never get my head around is how long will that work? Basically, I know that some people don't like to be involved here, but I don't want to use. Yeah, so in practice, you, you this kind of disaster, you you it, it will you typically have to deal with this right after the disaster happens. Uh, I have never experienced it having to clean up something so long after the fact that garbage collection has managed to kick in. So, I don't know. Does, it, does it do the changes without, I mean, with creating a new branch so that you have both branches? Yes, that's uh, usually what's, uh, usually it's before you start doing this, uh, before you start doing any aggressive uh, reiteration of history, it's handy to just create a branch where you are now and call it like uh, before rebase or something. Just a local branch that's just for you, just so it's easier to go back to the previous state and maybe when you want to do a diff afterwards to just check that you, you didn't have any unintended consequences. Okay, the warning message you just talked about yeah. So it helps you it describes how you would create a new branch from that point. Yeah, it does. Uh, because that's usually what you want to do. It's it's if you just want to work on a detached head without a branch, it's a bit masochistic. Uh, but like I'm I'm just trying to show like how low level you can do stuff. Probably. <laughs> like I said, I got used to the, the shitty tools that were there from day one or two, and I haven't bothered learning better ways to do things. I think there's, there's uh, big tools and I don't know if it's like a way that's a bracket page or something like that for like where the head was so many movements ago. The red okay. yeah. is the big thing that you just want to mark. Yeah, well, that, well, I mean, you can also reference to, oh, where my head was. Oh, yeah. 
two operations ago or something like that with MD and it was the one base you could just easily go to and it worked. I don't know. Yeah, that's the thing I did uh, here. Yeah. I said I will well, rebase that is, that from is for the back in history from the head, right? Yeah, but yes. not, not for movement of the head. Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah. That's, I misunderstood. I think you also have something like that, but I'm not quite sure what this is there. Yeah, it probably exists. But, uh, okay, I, I just wanted to get back to this. <laughs> yeah, the, the, like I said, the, the, com the command line interface is a bit horrifying. I, I, I find it a lot easier to just work on the mental model of the graph and the objects and just anything I can do with that model. I do it in my head and on paper, and then I try to figure out what the hell kind of commands I need to invoke to do this. Because it's anything you can do on these models is possible. It's just the commands have wildly different names and different flags and look different and taste different. And, yeah. So you give it a low level talk because the high level stuff is too uh, difficult. <laughs> Yeah, I hate it. Now, now we have uh, usually the, the graphical. There are like graphical clients for all operating systems that presents this in a much better way than the command line. Anyway. So it does have a question I have actually. Yeah. You point out there are better tools. So uh, I've been looking for uh, cross platform and open source, and we have kind of got that to that the Git U and Git A is the ones that actually. Nothing yes, I've only seen people use proprietary stuff that's better than them. Right. So I, I have nothing to give there. That's yeah, no, I, I tried like not cross platform tools, they're also crap. <laughs> not crap actually. Yeah, they are. So <laughs> again, that's why I, I'm really happy that the model below is clean enough that you can work on it without all these shitty tools. The best tool is your brain. Yes, five points. Uh, so that was the end of part two, which was history and branches and tags. I will talk a bit about the distributed repositories, unless there are more questions on refs. Cool. If you think of any question on earlier slides at any point, just still yellow. Uh, so it's a, it's not a, just a version control system, it's like everything else these days, a distributed version control system. So I'll show how that is done. And you have probably seen, if you've been working with Git, you have your master and you have something called origin slash master that you see sometimes when you need to talk to the server. So I'll just explain that, those things. Uh, so here we have three clones of this, basically the same repository. Uh, they share the same first two chain sets. Then repository number one has this history, repository number two has this history with some branching, and the third repository has shares three chain sets with number two, but does something else. All of these are um, valid because it, it's a consequence of the append only data structure that any, all of these states can be unified cleanly. Like this extra commit does not change this one at all. This is unchanged. So this is just an uh, uh, yeah, appended. So we can pull, if we pull the left repo into the middle repo, we take uh, these two chain sets, the, this one points to that one, and it's fine. And we can pull in from the right one also, that should give us the green one, and that's fine. Uh, from this, I have a bit of a bad question to ask. Um, these are three computers. One of them is my working computer. One of them is something else. And one of them is our central Git repo. <coughs> Q 
Can anyone guess which is which? No. You can make some guesses. Uh, it could be the middle one that pulled in changes from two workstations. That it could. Yeah, it could. It's uh, that. Yeah. You could. Yeah, you would push from the developer machines usually. That is like, uh, end result is the same. Uh, so that is a valid answer. Um, the exact state was that this is my laptop. This is the laptop of my colleague, and this is the central repo. The point I was trying to make there is that the entire process of history and objects and merging and pushing and pulling uh, is not dependent on some central server or some network structure or anything. It's just repos that exist independently. Which one is the central server is just meaning that we developers put on top of this. It's not inherent in Git. Um, from my perspective, these two machines, my colleague's machine and the central machine, are just uh, things called remotes. And remotes have names. The default name for the first remote you add is origin. That's typically what you call the central server. And I also added the laptop of my colleague here as a remote, the quality H. And here we can see this is my state from earlier. I this is master as far as I'm concerned, but uh, TAH has been doing some more changes here. So that's his master, which I was made aware of after pulling in his changes. And after pulling in changes from the central server, I see that the official master is this change. So what I will usually do now is to unify this stuff and push it back into the master. Uh, because now we have three divergent developments and we really only want to end up with one. And that's just a merge, which is a commit with three parents. So I've only merged locally now. Uh, so my master branch is updated to this. I have not done anything with the other two machines, and the br the remote branches reflect that I haven't really. Th there are no changes to them as far as I know. And as an aside, um, I'm merging three branches here at one time. Uh, this is not the common super common thing to do, but that's mostly because people find it uncomfortable to mentally work with, including me. But it's possible, and it's it's not a problem for Git, and it's called an octopus merge. Uh, and it's also the inspiration for uh, GitHub's OctoKitty. And if I push my new stuff to the uh, origin server, all of these, like I think this one, this one, this, and these commits are first added to the uh, repository history and the objects, and then the <coughs> master branch of the server is updated after that to point to the latest commit. And locally, since I now know that this is the state, of the origin server, I update my origin slash master branch. Yeah, any particular reason why you pulled from uh, commit instead of coming pushing to the central server and pulling from it? Uh, yes, it was to have a better example. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it uh, it would be <clears throat> it's not a workflow that makes sense for us, but it could be that he does not have permission to do it. 
push anything to that server. Uh, either because he's a con dirty, filthy consultant, uh, mm -hmm. or because we just struggled to set up his email or something. Well, maybe you were both on the train together, working, and there was no internet, so you couldn't reach the server. Yeah. And you already wanted to do reviews and all that. And yeah. Just pulled all this stuff. Yeah, he could put he could copy his folder to USB stick, and I could plug it into here and pull the changes right up. That would be, that would be. Uh, this could be that. So it's it's possible, and Git doesn't care. It's whether we find the mental model of multiple uh, remotes comfortable to work with. That's the only hurdle. It seems like the, the Microsoft Core thing is just this. You just have it peer to peer. Yeah, some people actually do work like that. Uh, it was one of the original use cases, I think, just people pulling from each other and just agreeing on stuff. But uh, for most people, having a central authority is uh, a lot <coughs> easier to deal with. Especially if you're a different type of company. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and that was all I had. Um, questions? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, <laughs> as we can see, if, if if I do, if I would do some sort of, it could actually be that that's what happened here on TAH's machine. He had this version of the master server. Uh, master and he went back to that point and rewrote. He, he did a rebase and rewrote history. And as we can see, it just creates a different uh, development history. And from when you try to unify this with a push or pull, it's treated. Exactly as if you just went and had and did some other development. So let's say I do, in my previous example, I do all of these commits, push them to the server, and then I rebase and push that. Then I, the server will get like a divergent history. And I will not actually be able to push if I refer to the same two things as master. Because the server will reject it and say, no, this is not following from the master I have. So I will be forced to either do a merge of these two histories, which makes sense for Git, but it looks very stupid in the history view, because it's just like the same variation of the same change sets in two different branches and a merge. Uh, or I could do something really horrifying, uh, which is a force push, which is to reset the master branch on the server to point to this new history, which makes the old history just hidden and invisible. Uh, that is fine if I'm the only person who has talked to the server. If someone else has checked out this history, they will get problem when they start to push. So Can they not just push, right? But they every pull, would that also need to be a false pull, right? If they already have the newer version and they want to add the older version and you want to get the new one? Uh, well, they, they would get both histories, but uh, Git would stop where it says, okay, I can't figure out what master is here. Yeah. So but then it would even like have If you to... already have the old master and then you, you, someone force pushed and then you just want to pull, yeah. then it will, will complain, right? Already. It, it will complain, but then you can sort of force yeah. your state to be updated to that state and clean and it I up like that. Somebody else's problem. Uh, yes. Basically, it could be giving them the job of taking what they have previously checked out and merging it with uh, what they you now say is the uh, actual data. Well, yes. Actually supposed to merge it. I mean, you can't merge it because it's the same change sets. Yeah, you can. No, yeah. Well, the change you did there, 
and the changes that are on master, they're the same changes. Yeah. So that you, you did some modification. Of the uh, yeah, that's, that's true. If, yeah. if When you try to do a merge which looks at the diff, it will be very confused and you will have to yes. manually tell it what to do. Yeah, you just have to like rebase the changes that he made on the middle tree on top of his uh, master instead. Yeah. So it's it's in it's, uh, don't 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 start <laughs> changing history after you've pushed. It's very impolite and I think it's a great idea. It is. Yeah. It, uh, know, if if you're very coordinated, it works fine. But usually it it it's not. And mm -hmm. like Rob said, you you instead of it's your job to clean this up, it's it's not just someone else's job. It's several people who need to do this individually, and if yeah. they do it differently. <laughs> so just have remind still me that new to problems. not be on my team. <laughs> <laughs> so if I work directly on gitlab.com, I never have to push, so I can always just edit the history as I want. <laughs> yes, I suggest that to keep things simple. Yes. Uh, what do you mean by force pushing the tree without the tag? Uh, like the tree can always be pushed; it doesn't have a conflict. It's just when you put in like the tags and the branches that you can get conflicts. Yeah, the branch. Okay. Yeah. 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 To the server. Uh, no, uh, the tags are not commits exist without knowledge of tags or branches or wraps of any kind. They are a separate data structure outside. So you can send a command to the server that says forget this tag. Uh, that does not add or change any commits, it just removes the, the tag. Uh, uh, okay, maybe. Uh, the, it, has, it has, I think for that thing, it has multiple commands. Um, and you can of course just log into the server and delete it, but that's a bit rude. But it would probably not accomplish what you're trying to do because everyone else that's already checked out a version that has that tag won't automatically have it deleted when they post. It's not like you send a change that says this tag should be deleted. You just sort of remove it so that it forgets it. But everyone else still has it and someone else will probably push it back if they already have it. Yeah, if... You will get the, an error message that it you have to the same thing is supposed to be two different things. Please help <laughs> fix it. Yeah, tags are usually not expected to move. Like tags and branches are in principle the same thing, except tags are supposed to be static, and branches are supposed to follow development. So the warnings for moving and resetting them will be different, but you can on the model layer, just do the same thing with both of them, move, delete, wait. Uh, again, please? After the movement updates, you just change the branch tag. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, the, all the stuff I did uh, is assuming I have not pushed the changes to the server yet. Uh, changing the commit message will create a new commit and a new development history going to the current master pointer and would give the same problems if I'm working, if I'm trying to rebase change some state that's been replicated to uh, either the server or other people's machines. So what do you do then when 
the movie get out of the park to push private key into the central cluster. To push what? When he pushed his private key or password mm -hmm. into the central cluster, then he then lose pixel. That's what we heard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So you can do that, but that you should. Um, yeah. So if it's really important to take it out again, you will have to coordinate everyone who uses the repo. Tell everyone, please stop. Wait. I need to reset the branch pointers. Everyone follow my lead and do the same. Or just everyone push to the server and uh, wait a bit and then do a force pull after I'm done to get the state I put there. It's it's a, that's a bit of like emergency disaster cleanup behavior. Does it still have the connecting uh, connecting all the routers? It will have it, but it's not in the history that's viewable. It's in the forgotten areas that will be garbage collected at some point. You can run the garbage collector explicitly. Yes, you can. Yeah. And in the old days, you had to at some point. <laughs> These days you don't. So, uh, just a general, uh, not coming up with Git for, uh, for Git cross customers, uh, how, what is your personal workflow regarding dealing with uh, merge concepts? Mm. Or tooling, are you? Which tools I'm using? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the worst ones. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Head. Yeah, so there are, it's been, depending on where I work, it has been different. Um, where I worked in a few years back, where we were just like two, maximum three people who shared the code base, we had this proprietary Windows tool which gave us this, okay, here's this file, here's that file, which one do you want to keep? I click on the one I want. Uh, since... That, after that, I worked on some code base mostly alone. So then I kind of just in the command line, just okay, I want this file and this file, and added them manually to a thing called the staging area, uh, which works fine if you if you know what all or each of the conflict origin points are, you can just select stuff. Uh, now I am just. I have not run into it yet at this OT, this issue. So I don't have a favorite tool. Okay. Yeah. You can just have the, the dip put into the file, right? And just manually edit it? Yeah, that is one of the, yeah, that's my default. Uh, it, if you can get used to reading that, it's, you, you can get the, it will be easier for you. In the long run, just good to not forget a file because otherwise you just commit a file that has some dip in it. Yes, uh, you would have to explain when, when you get the merge conflict where you have this annotation within the file. Uh, it's you can't commit it without saying, Yes, I have cleaned up this file now with an explicit command. Now, so if it is code, I suggest that you compile it before it begins. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you can do it by accident, but then you would have to fail twice. So. Yeah, that's that's perfect. Yeah. Well, maybe you could consider it when you use it. It, it also has this thing called a staging area that I did not mention today, which is I recommend looking into. It is like a sep you have like the state of the latest commit and the state of the working tree, but you have a third state, which is what I intend to put in my next commit, which is its own separate uh, state of the system, where you can say, I want to put this file in my next commit, and this file, and this part of that file, and no, not this file, and just clean it up like that, and then do the commit. Sort of a work in progress. Yes. Is it an actual commit technically on the car system? <clears throat> not sure. That's, I think. <laughs> The thing, the way the working directory is, like, uh, the staging area is just like kind of if you do git add, for example, right? I think mm -hmm. then it, that's when it produces the blobs of the file that you that you do, right? And then even if you change the file afterwards, you still have that blob 
that you said, this is what I want to commit. And yeah. You forget about it and then you have to commit again because. <laughs> yeah, so usually you run like a little get status or uh, to, to just show what the current state of your commit is. And if you are. If you're being very, if, if you're just being very clean and keeping a git ignore file clean, the git status command will give you exactly what you need to know. It will show in red, these are files that are changed on the file system, but you have not put them in the commit yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, one comment yeah. about the git ignore. Uh, usually you commit the JSON file. Yes. Uh, and sometimes, or rather, I want to ignore files that is not supposed to be ignored by us. Yes. Uh, for that, we use the info uh, .git slash info slash exclude. Okay, I have not used and, this. Uh, uh, it's turned out to be quite useful, so I'm glad I used it. Yeah. Good. Uh, dot .git info exclude file? Yeah. yeah. I'm just repeating uh, it for the for camera. Dot project files and uh, uh, dot uh, taskbar files from file system different from the common side. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. You made some hand motion. No, I was just uh, dancing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you just, 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 just you call them blobs. Are they binary non objects? Yes, I think that's yes. why they're called. So, why does it care about new land? Uh, it, they don't. Yeah. That's not on the model layer. That's on the yeah. higher up on the command line tools trying to be helpful with you layer. <laughs> Is that the official name of that layer? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Is that the official name of that layer? <laughs> I think they, I, I don't know if they use it anymore, but they call it uh, the plumbing and the porcelain. <laughs> Originally. <laughs> Mentally, model-wise, what's the main difference between Git and Mercurial? Um, I have really not dug into Mercurial deep layers enough mm -hmm. to s talk like uh, confidently about it, but uh, it is that the the commits uh, the the commit and commit history is its own thing separate from branches, which makes sure that any sort of divergent history is possible to unify. And any changes you do before you push to the server can be reorganized or changed or reworked. And if I commit a bunch of stuff and you commit a bunch of stuff, I can say, like git pull dash dash rebase, which means I will take in your changes and pretend I did my work after yours. Uh, so it's it's th this separate this clean separation makes it possible to work in a cleaner way. Is my impression in Mercurial? I frequently had to if there was any sort of conflict, I would have to check out a clean version and redo some stuff or install a separate extension to make pretend commits. But with Git, I just work directly with the tool and accomplish all of this. And if anyone commits anything that, or, or deletes a commit or, or fucks it up, uh, if they just like take their hands off and, and take a deep breath, they can just Revert to the previous state and um, fix anything. Uh, I know a little bit more about the, the, the four different systems, and, and uh, they, yeah, they, they, they encourage widely different uh, uh, default working behavior. In terms of functionality, you kind of get the ability to work like Mercurial in Git if you really, really want to, and you can work like Git in Mercurial if you really, really want to. You need to just map your melting mode in the different things. Like, for instance, the thing that Mercury calls branches is uh, something completely different than what the Git calls branches. If you want to use Git style branches in Mercury, for instance, you need to actually use what is called root map, which is the thing that is, is 
point of into into your drop uh, mid drop that you basically bumped up that same when you use the mix. Uh, and if you if you are basically what we call granted a more data that you uh, uh, embed inside of your mix uh, uh, as metadata instead of something else. And by that default model, uh, uh, um, you uh, in in mature you kind of are always working on the, the catch map in that you are not using the uh, map at all. But the catch map or the tooling that you have is designed towards that and working towards the uh, in interpreting the metadata of the mix instead of uh, uh, actually using those book maps for anything useful. So in while in Git, you, when you have something that doesn't point to your mix in terms of a, 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 a branch or tag, then you, the tooling typically don't show it to you. But in Mature, uh, you, the tooling typically shows you everything and that's the explicit you say, uh, please don't show this. And so on a very deep level, it's yeah, quite similar, but in every or the porcelain layer or, or the UI tooling on top of it, that's it, it, it encourages vastly different uh, working uh, uh, models uh, that you typically use it. Hmm. When you push in Git, do you push um, everything or just the tag? Uh, it's it, it's a bit it's configurable. What a just Git push and nothing else will do. Uh, the minimum thing it does is to push the commits that's on your active branch uh, back to where you have a common commit with the server. Uh, I usually, if, yeah, it, it, it will also update the corresponding branch on the server. But uh, any like new branches, different branches and tags that you have locally, uh, you need to explicitly send them to the server with different commands. And the same with poll, you don't really get all your branches and tags by default. You can configure it, I think, but I don't like to do that, so. Okay. Thank you for showing.